This week you'll be getting a formal introduction to geographic information systems and specifically to ArcGIS which is probably the most widely used commercial GIS software out there. It's used uh, commonly by both government and private industry and unfortunately it's not free like the other applications we've been working but we do have access to it in the Digital Geography Laboratory in Meyer Hall 325. So I'm going to walk you through an introduction to ArcGIS and some of the things I'll be showing you are going to be a little bit different when you're working on the computers in the DGL, but I'll, I'll point that out. So first off, uh, to start up ArcGIS in the DGL, you'll be going to the Start menu and looking for a folder called uh, Advanced DGL Applications or something to that effect. And within there, there should be a folder uh, called ArcGIS. And within that folder, there will be a particular application that we're going to focus on called ArcMap and you'll be working on version 10.2 which is the latest version available um, I have 10.1 right here but there's no appreciable difference so you'll start that program up and it might take a little uh, a minute to start uh, but when it does what you'll see is uh, a, a new document window will pop up and it'll ask if you want to start with a blank map or some other template for the moment we're not going to worry about that because we're not making any maps quite yet so we'll cancel that and then we'll see the main window for ArcMap, which is one of the components of the ArcGIS software suite. So what we have here in the window is our two basic areas. One is a table of contents area, and that's where you're going to see the list of GIS layers that we're going to work with. On the right-hand side, the larger panel, this is going to be where the data will be displayed to you. You'll actually see the data that you'll be working with. Up above, of course, you have your menu items, and then you have your toolbars with a variety of different tools. Most of them, when you hover your cursor over them, a little help window will pop up to tell you what that tool does. But we'll talk about a few of them today. Um, over here on the far right is a tab called Catalog. And when you just hover your cursor over that Catalog tab, it'll open up and show you this um, uh, Catalog tree that kind of looks like your file management system when you're in Windows Explorer. Um, this is important because we're going to use this to manipulate our data and to get access to it. So one of the first things to understand in ArcGIS is that in order to get access to the data that we're going to use, you have to make a folder connection to the data. So you can't just navigate to the data you want to open. You actually have to establish a shortcut. And you do that through a variety of ways, but we'll do it right now through our catalog. So with my cursor hovering, hovering over catalog, I'm going to move over and look for this button right here called Connect to Folder. Uh, it looks like a little folder with a dark plus sign on top. When I click on that, it'll give me the opportunity to connect to the folder that contains the data that I want to look at. So on my computer, I'm going to navigate to the folder that I've set up ahead of time in my uh, Dropbox folder right here. And I'm specifically looking for the USA folder that contains the data uh, that we'll be using for the exercises in Chapter 5 and, and later. On the DGL computers, that folder, the USA folder with all the data you need, is going to be on one of the network drives, which means it'll be on one of the drives that are V, X, or W, something like that. Uh, and I'll send out a separate notice to let you know exactly where to find that data. But if you get lost and you can't find it while you're in there, you can always ask one of the lab techs who can help you find that particular folder. So once I find the folder that I want, I select it, and then I hit OK. And that's it. It establishes a connection. I go back to look at Catalog. And I have a lot of other connections in here, obviously. The one we're interested in is the one I just established, this one. And it shows you the full path to that data that's in that folder I just created. You can see that right here. And while that folder is highlighted in blue, I can see the contents of that folder. And you can see within there, there are a variety of files uh, that are there, um, probably about 15 in there. And most of them are GIS files that, we're gonna, uh, that we could work with. But I just want to point something out really quickly. So this is what we see through our catalog, this 15 or so uh, items in here. This is very different from what you'd see if you looked at it through Windows Explorer, in part because our catalog really controls what you can see and what you can do because it's really only managing GIS files. Anything that's not a GIS file, it won't show you. And plus, things that you don't need to see it doesn't show you either. So if I went into Windows Explorer to look in the same location, just to give you a sense of what that would look like, if I go into the USA folder, this is what I see. Okay, I'm in the same location, right? This is the same location I'm in our catalog, but what I'm seeing are more than four times as many files, right? 
And in fact, if you pay close attention, you'll see that, for example, right here, the, a number of them have the same uh, starting name. Cities, for example, is repeated, and the only difference is all the ex extensions. And it turns out this is actually all one layer that we'll work with, uh, but it has a lot of pieces to it, which means that it's dangerous to work with these files in a Windows Explorer or other file management system. What you want to do is you want to make sure you're working within our catalog. So when I click over here to this tab, again, you see how few are there I see here. And again, that's just a controlled view so that you don't accidentally move something you don't need to move. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bring some of this data into ArcMap and play with it. So there's a couple ways I can do that. I can click on one of these layers, like Cities for example, and hold down the left key of my mouse and then drag it over into the table of contents and let it go. And what I see then are the Cities layer, a variety of points laid down very quickly. And you can already tell the basic outline of the continental US, con contiguous US. I can also add data by going to the Add Data button in the main menu toolbar. If I click on that, what it'll do is it'll give me access to all the shortcuts that I've established, those folder connections. So here it's already connected to the USA folder, so I can see the different layers available to me. So I'm going to add several layers now. So holding down the Control key on my keyboard, and then clicking one at a time, I'm going to choose the Rivers layer, the States layer, and this US48SHD.jpg uh, file. And I can let go of the Control key, and then click Add, and it'll add all these layers all at once. Okay, And you can see they're all displayed over here in the Table of Contents. There's four different layers shown over here in the Table of Contents. Right? Now, three of these are vector layers, the points, the lines, and the polygons. And one of these <coughs> is a raster layer, this JPG. In fact, any image file is, is technically a raster file, but there's other types of raster files as well, which we'll look at more closely later. But let's just look at these for, the second, for a second. So <coughs> each of these layers is arranged in a particular order, right? This is a drawing order. Imagine that these are each kind of like a map sitting on one on top of the other, sort of a semi-transparent map you can actually alter the order of these things. In fact, if I took the states, for example, and I held down the left button key in my mouse and dragged it upward above cities and let go, you'd see that the cities and rivers are all, have all been obscured. And that's simply because the states is now sitting on top of them and it's opaque, so you can't see through it. If I turn states off, for example, then you can see the underlying features there. right? So in this case, by default, Arc organized the layers in such a way that you're more likely to see all of the available layers that are there. So I'll turn states back on, and I'll click and drag it down so it's below rivers, okay? so we can see it again. So um, that's kind of how you, the layer ordering works in Arc in terms of the layers. Again, imagining it's a stack of different maps sitting one on top of the other. Some of them you can see through them, some of them you can't. Now, uh, when I move around within this environment, um, I'm using a few tools. So I can zoom in more closely by using the zoom in tool. If I click on that plus sign and then click anywhere in the map, it'll incrementally move me closer. In fact, you can see the scale displayed over here. In this case, I'm at 1 to 30 million right now. Alternatively, I can hold down the left key, the left button on the mouse, draw out a box, and then let go, and I zoom right into just that area. To zoom back out, I can use the zoom out button the little magnifying glass with the minus sign. And I can click once, do it incrementally, or I can draw a box and it'll zoom me out a little more quickly. Or if I get lost and I've zoomed in too closely to something I don't even know where I'm at, I can always click on the zoom to full extent button which looks like a little world. If you click on that it'll take you far, far out so that you're to the full extent of all the available data layers that are in the table of contents. Right? So that's how you move around. You can also pan around by using the pan hand, you just click and drag, and that'll move you around the screen. So there we can navigate within this area that we're interested in. Okay, let's look at a couple things. So we're working with vector and raster types of GIS data, and there's some important differences between them. So when I zoom in to this area, I'm going to look in Northern California, Oregon area, you can see the lines, which are the rivers, you can see the points which are the cities, 
and then you see these kind of solid blue areas which with the thin borders and those are the polygons okay now the points that represent cities are points in the geometric abstract sense you can zoom into them get closer but you'll notice that no matter how close you get they stay the same size I'm zooming in repeatedly in fact you can check my scale changing as I zoom in and they don't get any smaller and the reason is that the point is just an abstraction all the point really represents is a position or a location the the representation doesn't allow you to measure anything because again it's a Cartesian point it has no width or length it just has location again just an abstraction just for the for the purposes of, of, of representation in a GIS I'm going to zoom back out here. Lines work the same way. So any one of these rivers, if I zoom into it, I can clearly see that it has length. It obviously has position too, right? It's located somewhere in space. But if I zoom in very closely to the line, no matter how close I get, the line won't get any thicker, right? Because it's a true line in a Cartesian sense. It has length and has position, but it doesn't have width at least not a measurable width that's represented here. In reality, it would, of course, all rivers have width. But again, just an abstract representation for the purposes of illustration within a GIS environment. Finally, we have our polygons. And I'll zoom into Nevada here. And Nevada contains this outer boundary, OK? And Nevada has length or width, however you want to define that. It has area. It has a perimeter, right, the length all around there. It has an inside and an outside. Um, so it has a few, it has a, a more dimensions than points or lines, but it's still two-dimensional, right? Because it's essentially treated as if it's flat. So there we go. Now the thing about these uh, uh, vector types of representations of GIS data is that they're kind of like stick figure representations of the world. If you can imagine how you would draw things in simple lines and simple geometry, okay? And they exist as whole entities. So you have an individual point, an individual line, it's like one thing and you have an individual polygon representing an individual feature. This is very different from raster. And so I'm going to drag up this uh, US48SHD raster up top so it's given prominence. And what we see here is, let me zoom in so you can see this a little better, is a topographic representation of the contiguous US. right? And so you can see a little bit of topography, particularly in the west, Right? You can see the mountain chains and the valleys. Right? Um, but as we zoom in closer, what you'll notice is it begins to look pixelated. Right? It looks kind of blocky. And that's exactly because it is. The fact the closer you get, the more you can see what it's made up of. In fact, this is what rasters are made up of. It's essentially a grid of cells. Each one of these boxes is one cell in this overall grid. And each cell contains a single value. The value could either be a brightness color or it could actually be some kind of information but it's just going to be a number of some sort. In this particular instance what we have essentially is uh, an image that's meant really for us to interpret with our eyes. So the, the meaning of the individual cells is so important rather the pattern that they form overall is what's important. So what, what's going on here is that we have this grid of cells which create a pattern which our eyes can recognize as being supposed to be the topography of the U.S. and that's the, that's the purpose of it. But there you go is a very different um, kind of form of, of showing you data compared to the vector data, right? So the raster data in this case is to show you a pattern whereas the vector data showed you individual features. Okay, so that's vector and raster. Let me turn off the raster for the moment. We're not going to use it uh, for this example.